Funny games, hey. Jeez. What a nightmare. If you don't find it funny from the get-go, there's little the game can do to win you over. They're constructed around their comedy. And if that comedy isn't working for you, then it's built on a foundation that you're just not going to enjoy. It doesn't matter if you're playing Monty Python and the Elden Ring. If, if you sigh instead of chuckle when a little guy with some coconuts starts clopping behind you instead of, you know, summoning Torrent... Oh boy, that game has no chance and you have no chance if you've got to review it because you've got 89 more hours of that. By the end, you're going to be murderous. Anyway, let's see how that, that concept pans out for possibly the final game, the final, the last big game of the year, Justin Roiland's and Squanch Games High on Life. Eighteen reviews. That doesn't seem good. Codes were only sent out last week, and the embargo was early this week, and that also doesn't seem good. But the high score at time of publishing this uh, review of reviews is uh, a nine. That seems pretty good. That said, the lowest score is a, a three, a number we saw, well, most recently last week when the Jimquisition took on the Callisto Protocol. That seems less good. Obviously a divisive game. Uh, overall, it's got a 76 on Metacritic and it's holding on to a tight 47% recommended on OpenCritic. It's... Uh, it's a funny game. What else can you do? Games based on humor are always going to have a, a tough time just as games based on horror are because humor and horror are subjective. And as soon as it doesn't work, the entire game won't. Let's see if there's more to the complaints than just being sick of hearing Justin Roiland's voice. But uh, because of the way this game is looking on Open Critic and Metacritic, we're going to go the usual, our usual route of high scores first, and let's start there. Well, there aren't really enough reviews to go around, so uh, we're just going to grab the two highest and, and do it that way. We were going to branch out, but that works better when lots of people have reviewed the game and... Not enough people feel they had the time to do that. The first one off the line is uh, Xbox Error, who we have featured on this show before, uh, with a review from Jesse Norris, who is also a repeat customer, our first, uh, our first repeat reviewer, uh, repeat critic. I don't know. I don't have a term for it. I didn't construct one. Uh, they write, Higher Life is absolutely fantastic, and you should play it. Uh, yeah. All right. When Jesse, uh, Jesse's review was featured on the Callisto Protocol episode, uh, their paragraph was actually worth reading, not a single, uh, eight word sentence, sorry, nine word sentence. So, um, I know it was a little bit, a bit easier to glean what, what we might be getting out of it, but, uh, let's jump into the review and see what we get out of it. Properly, uh, here's a paragraph from it. Each weapon you earn has a unique personality. Kenny is voiced by Justin Roiland with his familiar delivery. JB Smooth kills it as Gus, a shotgun-style Gatlian. The voice cast is seriously impressive, and they do a great job across the board. It definitely feels like a lot of improvisation was used here, much like Squanch game, Squanch's other games, and the cartoons that Mr. Royland and company have worked on in the past. There is a lot of Rick and Morty style humor here, and that either hits for you or it doesn't. You can lower them out both your guns and the enemies talk during gameplay, but I loved it and kept the meters all the way up. 
The story is mostly ridiculous, constantly funny, and occasionally tugs at the heartstrings. Your sister Lizzie is a big part of things, and her growth throughout felt genuine and well-earned. The player never speaks, but you do get to choose responses for your Gatlians, who take over the duty of conversing. <sighs> I have legitimately seen entire reviews that were shorter than this paragraph, uh, but, you know, there's a lot in it. I think we could have, you know, hit carriage return, like right before we started talking about the story being ridiculous, uh, but, you know, or, you know, before we talk about how much the guns talk. There, there were a lot of opportunities, but I'm not editing. I've got to remember that the if we, uh, if we go into detail, if we analyze why this review uh, seems a little bit off, it's because they went for the twofer. They roped in uh, John, not that John Clark, Clark, who we've also had on this uh, on this uh, series before, to uh, to help them review the PC, sorry, the Xbox version of this game. And uh, yeah, with that in mind, it's sort of haphazardly put together, uh, a little bit stream of consciousness, which I think. You know, Justin Roiland would probably appreciate, considering, uh, you know, most of his shows. But uh, as a review experience, it comes across as a little bit, uh, it lacks structure. And uh, yeah, the analysis sort of falls quickly by the wayside. You could see it in that, uh, in that paragraph. I mean, I love the detail about being able to turn off the uh, gun voices if they're grading to you, but... At the same time, we then jump straight into uh, how the story plays out. And yeah, it's at this breakneck pace that I just think doesn't really uh, serve the reader very well. Still, if you know what to look for, there's, there's a bit to get out of this. The, the two-headed uh, approach sort of uh, allows them to make up for some of the shortfalls in the uh, structures, uh, structure. Anyway, um, yeah, I like I got a good like feeling for you know why Jesse liked the game, why it got a nine. Uh, some references to Doom Eternal, I think, really sold it for me. Um, a lot of references to Doom Eternal, which uh, is always pretty promising uh, in a shooter in twenty twenty two. I think. Uh, specifically referencing Doom Eternal over Doom 2016, that is. Uh, that's definitely what's happening here. So, uh, yeah, let's move on to the next one. Monster Vine. Diego Escala gave it a 9 out of 10 as well. High on Life is easily one of the funniest games I've played in a while and is a great game to close the year out with. Uh, my immediate thought is the funniest game isn't really a hotly contested genre. But on the other hand, like this year, we had Shadows Over Loathing, we had Monkey Island, we had a new Psychonauts game, and people were replaying Portal to see it with, you know, fewer frames and better lighting. So, uh, yeah, there actually are a couple of funny games around at the moment. So, yeah, it's a fair cop. Let's uh, check out the rest of the review. The game is even littered with really silly extras to discover that were treated with as much effort as the rest of the game. There's an achievement system that's dressed up as a bounty hunter forum board. You can read posts from other bounty hunters, unlocking new replies by doing things like killing a certain amount of a particular enemy or getting enough knife kills. And each of these forum posters are given as much thought to their character as the main cast. Getting to read the latest replies I unlocked was always a treat, hoping to see what some of my favorite posters in the forum were going to chime in with next. High on Life even features four full-length movies you can literally sit there and watch, some of which features commentary by members of Red Letter Media. Again, every aspect of this game was given full effort with their commitment to the game's premise, and it really shows. <sighs> I think we need science to tell us whether or not there's a causal link between liking Justin Roiland's games and writing really long paragraphs, because this was another really big one as well. Uh, I'm going to fixate on paragraph length, 
but I will not be editing. I will not be editing. Do not worry. Uh, this was a like this was a really interesting review, and this paragraph in particular. There's so much detail, uh, like in this game. It seems you know this this forum system seems really interesting and uh, plays out quite entertainingly in practice. And yeah, I you know I don't necessarily want to watch four full length feature films, but I don't know. It seems neat. Uh, other games have done stuff like it before and it's been weird but you know kind of cool I guess uh the problem this review had was that it sort of ended out of nowhere it was like it didn't have it sort of capped off at the second act it's just like yep and we're done there's no like there's no analysis into why it's not a 10 it's just sort of yep it's a uh, it's a 9 out of 10. This is what I liked. I like this and this and this and this. And there's no real criticism. There's no, yeah, like there's a lot of detail about the detail. And so I think it conveys the positivity, but I don't know what went wrong for it from this review. What, yeah, what holds it back? Uh, yeah. So uh, I think we're missing a bit of that. And it was also kind of missing in the Xbox era review and so as we get lower it's going to start to really kick in you know we're going to go from reviews that didn't have a lot of criticism to reviews that i suspect by the time we get to a three have lots of it and that that impact i think will be felt quite quite strongly anyway let's uh check out our medium scores now with 11 scores sitting in the middle ground between the 9s and the 5.5, uh, we rolled an 8 and a 1, and we reversed the order so we could count downwards. Uh, so we're going to kick off with PC Invasion. Andrew Farrell wrote the review for PC Invasion, gave the game a 8.5. They wrote, Higher Life is a hilarious piece of comedy that also makes for an enjoyable first-person shooter, especially if you're into Justin Roiland's brand of humor. Especially if you're into Justin Roiland's brand of humor is a very interesting sentence to me because it implies the game's good and funny even if you're not, uh, even if you're not particularly, you know, amused by Roiland's antics or his two voices. Um, yeah, it's a very, very big claim because... It's kind of built around, you know, I mean, it's his it's his game dev studio and, yeah, he's the main voice actor and credited as a writer and, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's an interesting one. I, I think I'm very intrigued as to whether or not they can back up that claim um, or even if that is the claim, if maybe I just misread what they're getting at. Uh, maybe there's some context missing from the greater review. Mostly I'm interested to see if we get another 160 word article, uh, paragraph. That's my uh, that's my hope. So let's uh, let's check it out. If I had to describe High on Life in terms of another video game, I'd say it's a lot like Rage. The first one though, except this one's ending doesn't feel like it happens partway through a larger story. I will say that the ending was far shorter than I would have liked, as the game just kind of stops after the main threads are wrapped up before using Polaroids with writing on them to work as an epilogue. The game is an open world, but it does have three large areas you can travel to and from via the Bounty 5000 machine, which lets you pick what areas you, to where you'd like to warp. Andrew clearly has uh, fonder memories of the first Rage game than I do, if, uh, if they feel like that is a flattering comparison. Uh, it's interesting that they talk about how uh, Rage sort of just ended out of nowhere and then they go on to say that uh, that High on Life doesn't end out of nowhere but it does kind of end out of nowhere and uses Polaroids to wrap up the rest of the loose threads. That's a little bit worrying to me but I am starting to get a picture of how this game sort of works now. Uh, you know, it's got id-style shooting, I think, 
uh, is what I'm getting from these reviews. Uh, Doom's Doom Eternal style mobility, uh, and yeah, not not necessarily a uh, an open world Metroidvania, but a uh, you know sectored three sector uh, Metroidvania that you can return to whenever you like. Um, yeah, I think Andrew does a good job of justifying why the game worked for them and uh, why it would be good even if the comedy didn't land. I think it's pretty optimistic, though. Um, I think they've got, kind of got, like, blinders on. It happens sometimes. Uh, I think, like, we've all sort of enjoyed something despite a specific element before, you know, uh, I enjoy. I enjoyed my dinner despite the uh, the presence of some extremely sour Brussels sprouts, right? Uh, but I was able to appreciate the dinner without, you know, without having to worry about that. But uh, when 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 we're talking about humor or uh, or horror. That's that's so foundational that it'd be more like if it was you know a steak dinner with Brussels sprouts on the side and the steak was cooked well done, and you know you're eating a shoe, uh, basically, and uh, yeah you're like you can't really like the steak dinner if the steak doesn't work. So uh, yeah, it is uh, there's a logical leap to thinking you could uh, enjoy a game. Disp- despite not liking the humor, but in a game with humor, it it never works. I cannot think of a single instance where it has worked. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, one thing I liked about this review was that it was sort of written in the, uh, in the uh, like it had these really short sentences and uh, you could sort of imagine each full stop was like a Rick Sanchez style burp. Uh, they went for something kind of creative. It made it more entertaining, fun to read. And I think it works alongside the insight. You know, I think they may have missed the mark a little bit with uh, with the humor thing. But otherwise, yeah, there's a lot of great detail in here. Uh, and yeah, oh, and the longest paragraph was 151 words. Let's uh, Let's jump on over to the next one. Games Radar Plus. Got Josh West to review it, and they gave it a 3.5 out of 5. Higher Life is a confident and capable Metroidvania that takes real pleasure in being as weird and outlandish as is reasonably possible. In presenting combat underpinned by chatting weapons and worlds wrought with endless distraction, Squanch Games has created something that is well worth your time, even if some of its elements lack refinement. This review doesn't mention comedy at all. Doesn't mention the humor element at all, which I find really interesting. I think as we get lower down the list, uh, we're going to find, you know, more and more reviews that didn't really appreciate the sense of humor of the game as much. And uh, so we might be starting to see that here with Josh's review where they're trying to uh, excise themselves or their their subjective sense of humor from the from the act of critically analyzing the game which i think is a very interesting tack to take uh yeah let's uh have a look at the paragraph the desire for more surmounts the further you push into high on life While the main narrative thrust is certainly fun and full of surprises and smart subversions of genre tropes, the story does land flat on its face by the end. While the B story, which tracks your sister and her attempt to date an alien, and the C story, following Jean and government officials, fail to resolve in a satisfactory fashion. Then again, all things considered, it's surprising that High Life works as well as it does. It's incessantly loud, frequently unhinged, incredibly funny and an intergalactic trip that is well that is absolutely worth taking uh this this review was really well written and uh very entertaining to read uh, full of great details uh and great analysis on how they felt high in life came together they did 
attempt to uh, avoid talking about humor, except in really short bursts, like they did in, in that uh, paragraph that I, I grabbed. Otherwise, there isn't a lot of detail about where or not the, the humor landed for them. And I think that's a really interesting choice. Uh, yeah, it makes it, it actually gives the entire review a kind of like aloof feeling, but it winds up working. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure why. Uh, it might just be that it works in the context of reading a bunch of other reviews uh, because it adds a new element of analysis to the, uh, to the library, uh, to the almanac of the reviews that you're putting together, which, you know, as always, backs up the theory that you should read, you know, a bunch of reviews. Or, as always, I keep saying as always, watch a guy read a bunch of reviews, which is easily the best way to do it. Anyway, let's check out our unscored reviews uh, now. All right, we had three unscored reviews to pick from, uh, not counting people who took the coward's way out of not scoring their, their review yet. Uh, one of them was a YouTube video, which I'm not really ready to tackle yet. So uh, yeah, we flipped a coin and it landed on heads. So we've got Eurogamers review. Edwin Evans Thurwell. Thurwell, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Writes, a miserable cocktail of ideas from other action platformers and the worst parts of Rick and Morty. Well, I think I think we know what we're in for. Uh, let's let's just jump straight in. The problem is partly that the game beneath the toxic meta comedy isn't worth celebrating, and partly that Rick and Morty's dramatic tenets don't quite function when you wrap them around a bog-standard shooter campaign. Again, the show is all about speed. Put a player in charge and you create downtime and reversals, backtracking to areas with a new platforming ability, walking to a waypoint rather than conjuring a portal or jump cutting. Rick and Morty's bustling 22-minute arcs rely on Rick's ability to essentially edit out anything stale, unless Rick being boring is the joke, of course. High on life is 10 to 15 hours of things he'd do away with, which is why it hates itself so much. Uh, yeah, this review rules. Um, like, the way it begins where it tells you to stop reading because the game tells you it's not worth playing and so the review is telling you that it's not worth reading uh, is, you know, is a very clever little bit of meta horseshit that I have to imagine uh would grate on the author of the rest of this review uh but they execute it quite well so it winds up being pretty amusing uh in a deeply ironic and cynical manner however that is directly what they criticize high life for which uh yeah is uh is a little bit hard to uh to really put together at the end of the day uh that said it's it's extremely detailed uh it goes into a great amount of detail on what it thinks higher life uh does not succeed at and that is quite a bit it's the gameplay it is the comedy and it's not just uh it's not just a flat out I don't like this sense of humor but it deeply analyzes why it thinks the comedy doesn't work in this game that pa the paragraph we grabbed I think is a great example of it they wouldn't specifying that you know Rick and Morty is a game uh, is, a, is a TV show where often they just sort of skip past things that you know don't make sense and, and that doesn't translate to video games because you always have a lot of time to think about things while you're while you're moving from one location to another and uh, it goes into further detail in, in how the combat doesn't really feel satisfying 
Um, I, you know, I this review is fantastic. This is my pick for for the best one of the of. I don't know the reviews that we had available at time of doing this. I'm sorry if another one, a better one comes out after. Uh, but as always, random chance dictated that we might not have seen it anyway. So uh, who knows? Anyway, there is, I will say there is a, a chance that what they didn't find amusing will still be funny to other people. They, this like there is a chance that having to play this game in the space of two days meant that it became less digestible, right? That that is often uh, the one of the biggest challenges that reviewers face, and it's it's an unavoidable part of the gig because the reviews have to come out at Embarker, right? I mean, otherwise I'm not gonna put them into a reviews in review episode, which is obviously the most important thing that can happen for a review. But also if they don't come, like there is a significant drop off in, uh, in attention paid to reviews uh, after seven days. And reviews already have, have trouble bringing in traffic these days. So yeah. It's really important that they get out on, on embargo. And so if the game is delivered late or, you know, as embargo lifts or, you know, situations like that, it can, it, it almost invalidates the review itself uh, as people go look elsewhere. Uh, and the reason that reviews are important is because the analysis within us, like it, that Edward managed to put together this review within the three day, two day embargo, like time frame, is phenomenal because there's so much to it. They did such a good job. And you can't get that kind of analysis from watching a Twitch stream. You can get a feel or you can get an idea of what it will be feel like to play but you can't get a feel for it in the same way that a very skillful critic can convey that feeling using their words and that's that's kind of you know the essence of why reviews matter why reviews will continue to matter even even when we're all on tiktok and trying to squish them down into those 160 word paragraphs they'd never fly on tiktok i tell you what Playing over, you know, some some robot reading them out over footage of Railway Runner or whatever goddamn mobile game you got to play in the background to get people to pay attention, just wouldn't work. Um, anyway, anyway, I've deeply digressed. Uh, this is a really good review. Definitely recommend reading it. But uh, yeah, keep in mind, as always, uh, it's. You need more than one review. It can't. You can't just go based on on the one review, unless it's unless I wrote the review. In which case, you probably probably good because you know I'm the best. Uh, let's check out some low scores. All right, we had two low scores to pick from. Uh, let's well, we just grab them both. Uh, we'll do them in order, so highest to lowest. The first one we had was from Destructoid. Chris Carter wrote it. He was, they were on our very first episode, uh, Bayonetta. And uh, I believe they enjoyed Bayonetta. Most people did. Um, they did not enjoy this one. They gave it a 5.5 out of 10. Let's take a look at a uh, pull from the review. As is, Higher Life is a great weekend Game Pass pickup and something to go into with caution if you're a fan of Royland's work. I appreciate what Squanch Games is doing in the industry as a whole, but Trover Saves the Universe was a much better distillation of Royland and Company's humor in a sounder package. Uh, I found myself quite confused by this closer. It's a great weekend pickup on Game Pass, but a cautionary tale for Royland fans? Like, those seem, I don't know, like, also a great pickup, but a 5.5, uh, like, doesn't immediately make sense. 
I don't know. I'm intrigued. I gotta, I gotta know how this one plays out. Uh, let's go have a squiz uh, at a paragraph from the review. While those high octane moments I mentioned earlier do exist, they're not common. A lot of zones really lack oomph and just throw enemies from the same few doorways at you until you're allowed to proceed. Other sequences straight up allow you to skip every enemy entirely, which is easy to do by the time you get the jackpack. Throw in a really shoddy objective marker and a bit of imprecise area design and you have an annoyance stew going. Overall, this review wasn't like wasn't negative. Um, it was sort of like a, a really a true 5.5 out of 10. Like it stuck, it, you know, what a five is supposed to mean, you know, in the middle, right? It really went after that. That's how it reads as a, like a 5.5 that I might give, um, which is interesting. You know, normally I try not to uh, labor how I think reviews read compared to their scores because everyone scores differently. I will mention it sometimes when I feel it's way off, uh, but this one actually feels bang on. And I have become accustomed to reading, seeing a five and expecting a, a negative review. So, uh, Hey, that was a, that was a pleasant surprise. Carter, obviously, you know, it comes through in the text that, uh, they felt that the game, just didn't execute on all of its ideas. It had some really good ones, but just did, couldn't quite stick the landing on them. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. I, th I think it's a, a very good review. One thing uh, that worried me in this paragraph was uh, this idea that the game will have kill chambers and yeah, it, it's sounding less and less like Doom Eternal the lower we get. Um, it's reading less and less like Doom Eternal and more like Doom 2016. Uh, it's or, or Rage, you know, uh, where the kill chambers are actually just sort of stalling your progress and the traversal elements aren't interesting enough to make the combat all that intriguing there's only four weapons four main weapons um and carter's the first one to mention that you can sort of just use one if you if you want because most things die to a headshot or two headshots so i don't know it's starting starting to get a little concerning from a gameplay point of view but uh yeah otherwise this was a, a very good review that I, I enjoyed a lot and yeah I think they nailed that score. Well done. Uh, the lowest score we have is from But Why Though. Aaron Clues. Clues. Aaron Clues. Let's go with Clues. Gave the game a 3 out of 10. Anyone who isn't thrilled at the idea of having Royland constantly chattering in their ear for a dozen hours straight will likely find the game's incessant need to force itself on the player annoying. With the addition of uncompelling combat, frustrating exploration, and a lack of anything else to offer players, Higher Life is one of the most annoying, derivative, and slogging experiences in years. Uh, I don't really know what a slogging experience is, but I do know that Aaron Clues did not like High on Life. That much is clear. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a clunky paragraph, but uh, I, I can't wait to like to hear how how they came, how they arrived at a three out of ten, because it sounds like they didn't like it. High on Life also suffers from insufficient enemy variety to keep its combat interesting. There are only a handful of enemy types throughout the game, and the player is introduced to the, all of them within the first couple of hours. Once they are all seen, the combat never changes significantly to keep things interesting or push the player to adapt. High on Life goes to great lengths to give players options through movement abilities and alternative weapon fires, but there is never a reason to use them when most enemies need to be shot in the head once or twice. Uh, yeah. So Aaron appears to be an optimizer like me, uh, which is, well, it doesn't bode well for my enjoyment of this game on, in the long term. Uh, an optimizer is someone who uh, specifically 
finds the most efficient way to play through a game and then sort of sticks to it, uh, you know, in a pathological sense, uh, is unable to divorce themselves from playing at the, the best of their abilities to have fun. They optimize the fun out of the game. I know I do it. Uh, I try to remain aware of when it is happening, uh, but I also don't think it is the player's problem if they optimize the fun out of an experience. That is a developer problem, not a player problem. Players, right, will take the game and do what they will with it. The developer's job is to uh, find ways to keep it interesting, right? That's why, and I'm gonna, uh, I hate going back to this, but it has been, other people have mentioned this numerous times. The difference between Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal was that in Doom Eternal, they found a way to solve optimizing the game uh, to, to a, a point where it was no longer fun. In Doom 2016, once you got the super shotgun, you could just run backwards around rooms uh, picking up ammo. They aren't, there isn't as much ammo. The, acquiring ammo in Doom Eternal is different. You need to actually move forward. You need to rip and tear in uh, Doom Eternal to succeed. And uh, as a result, they created a game that I found to be vastly superior uh, as a shooter. I know that some people disagree with that. That's fine. Uh, they made they made other choices that people don't agree with. We're not reviewing Doom Eternal here. Uh, High on Life, it sounds like, is a game that is very quickly optimized. And once it's optimized, it can get tedious. Uh, one thing that I've heard, I've, I've read, through all of these is uh, that the weapons have different personalities and they're voiced by different people. You've got Tim Robinson as your rocket launcher, I think, and uh, someone mentioned JB Smooth as your shotgun. Apparently they all talk and they, they have different personalities. They like are interested in different things. And I think it would be interesting. It might be interesting enough to solve the optimization if you wanted to play the game with the, the shotgun out just to hear JB Smooth's commentary on the situation. And so you may be, they may have actually found a way to get around playing the game as optimally as possible. That would not have worked for Aaron because they found the voice lines grating and so they used the slider to turn them off. It wasn't enough. They they were still uh, too chatty in story moments for Aaron. And so, uh, sorry, the guns were still too chatty for Aaron in, in story moments. And so, yeah, clearly the humor didn't work on any level uh, for Aaron. And as a result, they sort of disabled the only option uh in the game to that that might have solved their optimization issues but that that is a byproduct of the game so their review is no less correct in its analysis they reviewed their experience and what they did was they tried to make it as fun as possible for them. Optimizers find it fun to optimize, to play efficiently. They find that more fun than playing inefficiently. So there's, there's, it's not just a case of, oh, we'll just play it inefficiently and you'll have more fun. Uh, the fun is derived from playing efficiently. So... Yeah, it's a it's a tricky one, right? They, they, it's a catch twenty two for both Aaron and for High on Life uh, when the two of them meet. But it it is a byproduct of the humorous game. That I mean, we predicted right from the very get go. The negative reviews will be people who did not appreciate the humor. In this case, the humor is, I think, supposed to alleviate the. Uh, I don't know, 
late 2010s shooter design, the Halo kill chamber shooter design. But because the humor didn't work, that was not able to be rectified. And as a result, the game felt worse and worse and worse until Aaron broadly hated it. Uh, I think they justify their position. I think, yeah, a little bit clunky, but uh, playing 11 hours is something that you hated from 20 minutes in is uh, is, is torturous. So, uh, yeah, I feel for them. Anyway, let's jump to the conclusion. Something interesting I noticed in every single one of these reviews was that uh, the critics all... Uh, said that they were fans of Rick and Morty. Even Aaron Clues professed to be a fan of of the series. And uh, yet this high on life did not work for them at all. I think it'd be really interesting to get someone who doesn't like Rick and Morty to review this game to see how it, how it panned out for them. But I do suspect that it might just be sort of, I don't know, against the Geneva Convention type thing, you know? You know, torture. Uh, yeah, cruel and unusual type thing. Um, yeah, for those who enjoyed the humor, High on Life was a, I don't know, a, a fun adventure through crazy alien locations filled with wacky and zany characters. And for those for whom the humor didn't work, High on Life was a tedious slog through alien locations filled with wacky and zany characters. I think Edwin uh, Evans Thurwell from Eurogamer makes the most compelling case as to why the Rick and Morty comedy style might not work in a video game or certainly didn't work for them and might not work for others in a video game. Uh, basically the game occurs uh, at a pace, well, the show occurs at a pace where, uh, you know, there's not enough time to stop for details. But on the other hand, Diego Escalo of Moz Divine felt that, you know, there are enough details to support playing High on Life and stopping to smell the roses. And at the end of the day, that that was kind of always going to be the way, right? Humor games are inherently divisive because humor is deeply subjective. And it's, it's no coincidence that the two most divisive games that we've had on reviews and review were a horror game and a humor game. Because when, when the foundation doesn't work, I've said it a billion times, the whole game won't, won't work. Iron Life is on Game Pass. Uh, so if you've got Game Pass, you can check it out on PC or Xbox uh, for a relatively extremely low price. Um, so I think that's that's probably the best way to find out if the humor works for you. Uh, I've played it. Uh, the humor's working for me, but I can already see some of my uh, some of those kill chamber concerns coming into play so uh yeah you know i and i've only played it for about an hour and a half you don't have to play for long to find out if it's for you which i think is good uh yeah other than that uh i think that's all we've got for this week's episode next week will be our last of the year it's gonna be uh it's gonna be a big one i'm gonna review my own reviews so, uh, yeah, it's going to be exactly as self-congratulatory as that sounds uh, because I am arrogant to a fault. So uh, stay tuned for that one. Otherwise, make sure you read all of the reviews listed here. They were generally very good. Uh, one of them was, was excellent. Uh, and, yeah, head to the GA podcast to hear me and my co-worker uh, co-host talk about video games i don't know uh be good to each other stay safe and uh yeah love you bye